Hello, and welcome to EDHREC's Upping the Average, where we take a commander's average deck list as compiled by the data on EDHREC and make some quick swaps to it to help take it from a good start to a great one. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Sephiroth of the Hidden Ways is the quintessential dungeon commander. Three mana for a 2-3 that helps you venture into the dungeon once per turn whenever a creature card hits your graveyard, and with a delightful reanimator payoff whenever you complete one of the dungeons. Sephiroth has always been well-loved and decently popular, but this commander saw its biggest upswing right after the release of Battle for Baldur's Gate. Where dungeons were once a cute mechanic without a ton of support, they now have a bunch of new tools to help them venture forth. There are even a bunch of other legends that care about dungeons now too, but Sephiroth fits squarely in the three most dungeon-tastic colors and gets to play with all of their best toys. Let's get going. We'll grab Sephiroth's average deck from the average deck feature and import it to the Architect deck building website. As always in this series, any swaps we make must either keep the total price of the deck cost neutral or else help lower the overall cost of the deck. Sometimes you can look through a deck list and immediately grok what that deck is up to. The synergies are obvious and apparent, the combos are clear and stand out from the rest of the pack, and you don't often find yourself looking through the deck wondering how it's all supposed to work. This is not one of those lists. Truth be told, Sephiroth took me a while to really get a grasp on, in part because the commander's ability itself is so tricky, but also because the commander is aiming at two different targets at the same time. This deck would be complicated enough with just the dungeon strategy, but it also contains a reanimator strategy, which helps give the deck a lot more game-winning punch, but which also runs the risk of dividing the commander's attention. And remember, we're technically not seeing everything that this deck is up to right here on this page, because of all of those dungeon cards that this deck will access throughout the entire game. These are the three original dungeons that we received in the original Adventures in the Forgotten Realms set, and while experienced dungeoneers might already have their favorites and know their preferred pathways, new players to the strategy are right to feel a little overwhelmed by all of these possible options. And then Baldur's Gate came along and added in the initiative mechanic, which also ventures into the dungeon, the Undercity. The Undercity can only be entered by taking the initiative, not just any venture into the dungeon card will help you there. However, once you are in any dungeon, any effect that lets you venture or take initiative again will help you progress into the next room. And like the Monarch, the initiative can be taken from you, so you have to stay on your guard. That was just a brief overview of the dungeon mechanics, but now let's talk about this deck's actual strategy and signature cards. Obviously, anything that helps us get bigger benefits from the rooms of our dungeons is extremely important. All those little effects really add up when they're doubled, or even tripled. And we have a lot of cards here that gain even more benefits if we've completed a dungeon as well. The Ravenloft, Tomb of Horrors, and White Plume Adventurers in particular are very powerful standouts. And of course, the deck contains a good number of utility creatures to help us venture into the dungeon multiple times per turn. Midnight Pathlighter is definitely an all-star, but truth be told, the real MVP is Radiant Solar. This is the best card in the deck, and it is not close. Like, this card is actually genuinely terrifying, and I'm convinced now that it also needs to show up in a bunch of Blink decks, too, because holy dang, it can easily cause you to venture through two dungeons in a single turn without breaking a sweat. Excellent piece of work. Shifting gears, we then have the Sephiroth Enablers. Sephiroth's ability lets us venture into the dungeon whenever a creature card hits our graveyard, but only once per turn. As a result, we have a lot of creatures here that basically immediately trigger Sephiroth's ability, especially by entering the battlefield and immediately getting sacrificed or forcing us to discard. However, the bulk of the enablers in this deck are there to help us do that work at instant speed. Drawing and discarding creatures on other players' turns helps us trigger Sephiroth's ability multiple times per round. Tortured Existence in particular is a really stellar standout. That one's an MVP in my Sir Conrad deck, and it puts in similar work here. Cards like Priest of Fell Rites and Doom Necromancer 2 will help get creatures into our yard at instant speed while simultaneously bringing other creatures back out of it. And that then brings us to the reanimation package. From Victimized to Unburial Rites, this deck takes on a classic reanimation strategy to revive all of those creatures that our looters have been discarding all game. And if those creatures happen to die again, then Sephiroth's own ability can help bring them all back too. This is why, personally, I find myself gravitating towards the Lost Mines and the Undercity Dungeons as much as possible when playing this deck. 
The Undercity is spectacularly good, especially that final room. And those tricky effects like goading creatures or chunking down enemy life totals is very handy. It serves Sephiroth well to try and get into the Undercity as often as possible. But that's also why I like the Lost Mines a lot, too. That one's the shortest dungeon, which means it's the easiest to complete, so we can more easily line up our initiative cards to let us into the Undercity after we've completed a dungeon. Plus, since it is the shortest trip, that means we get even more Sephiroth reanimation triggers. Whew. All right, that was a lot. But you know what? Fortune favors the prepared. So now that we know what we're doing, we can finally get to the upgrades. We'll tackle this deck in the following three ways. First, we'll survey the terrain and get a good sense of our surroundings. Then we'll make sure that we upgrade the things in our dungeoneering kit. And finally, we'll confront the final bosses. And don't forget, we'll have lower budget and higher budget honorable mentions at the end of the video. Let's get to it. This first part will be short and sweet. Just a couple of basic switches to our mana base will help us traverse through the game more swiftly and more easily. This is a perfectly serviceable land base, especially for a deck that runs leaner on the budget than some of the commanders we've recently seen in these videos. In particular, though, I want to linger on these, the Bounce Lands. These are my favorite things in a reanimator deck. Play them on turn two, wind up with eight cards in hand, and discard to hand size. Boom! Now we have a large creature in the yard to reanimate later. We've already got the main three, but I'll also throw in the guildless commons here. I always feel better about keeping an opening hand that has a bounce land in it. There are some lands that I want to cut out of the deck too, though, and I'll do them in one fell swoop. Port Town, Nimbus Maze, and Choked Estuary. All three of these feel lackluster to me in three-color decks, even in budget three-color decks. I like them for budget two-color decks, but for three-color, I think that they might hurt more than they help. They each have funky requirements about basic land types that is just a skosh less reliable in three-color decks, so I'll bid them adieu. Luckily, the cards we're replacing them with are even cheaper. Path of Ancestry is dirt cheap right now, but it's basically another Triland. And if we're already playing Arcane Sanctum, we should definitely play this one too. And since our commander is also a wizard, I rather think that Riptide Laboratory sounds pretty nifty. If Sephiris is ever under fire, then we can swoop it right back to hand, safe and sound. Plus, it can even save some of our utility creatures, like Haman Pashar or Midnight Pathlighter, because they are also awesome wizards. All right, quick and easy mana tweaks, three lands in, three lands out. Now we're on to part two. Basically, here we want to make sure that our tools have stayed sharp. We already have the best dungeon crawling and the best initiative taking cards in the average 99, but we need to make sure that our accessories for that strategy are still in good shape. You know, we don't want to get halfway through the journey and then realize that we accidentally left the rope and the matches back at home. So this here Dakon guy, uh, nah, I don't care for him here, sorry. I mean, the exile is neat, but unreliable and at sorcery speed. And the surveillability is cute, potentially getting a Sephiroth trigger, but again, that's not reliable. And again, that's also sorcery speed. We're more concerned about getting instant speed Sephiroth triggers because it's already really easy for us to get Sephiroth's effect on our own turn. So sorry, Dakon, I like you, but you're just not reliable in this deck. I also can't help but notice the high popularity of Merfolk Looter in this deck. Half of all Sephiris players are using this one because it's a great turn two play to follow up with Sephiris on turn three. Well, as long as we're playing one Looter, why not use a functional duplicate too? Thought Courier is the exact same effect, so this feels to me like a por que no los dos situation. Let's play them both. After that, I actually want to make a cut here. Burnished Heart stopped impressing me in this deck almost immediately. I, I like Burnished Heart, honestly, I do. I use this in at least two of my own decks, but here it just felt off for some reason. I feel like I should like it more here. It's ramp on a creature, which also triggers Sephiris. It just also feels like it takes a while, and this deck kinda struggles with speed. So much of the dungeon strategy is already so fiddly that I feel like the deck needs more gas, rather than trying to make sure that it squeezes out all of the value from all of these potential interactions. Plus, this is hardly an exciting reanimator target. It's a perfectly fine card, but I know we can do better. And lastly, longtime viewers already know that I don't particularly love Utter End. Four mana is just a lot to pay for pinpoint removal. Four mana is wrath territory, you know? And besides, I think this deck wants to try out more removal in creature form. For instance, Cathar Commando is really impressive. It's a blocker, it's an instant speed Sephiroth trigger, it's recurrable with cards like Barrowin or Sun Titan. I just really dig it, and I think that these are the types of little rewards that we will be much happier to find, especially since it costs less mana. Our deck has a lot of other removal already, and I think we'll be okay making this swap to sand down some of those edges. All right, part two is done, which means we're moving to the final room in our dungeon. It's time for part three, where we confront the final bosses.
There's always something big and scary at the end of the quest, right? Let's make sure that these creatures demolish any chance that our opponents have of defeating us and making off with the spoils. I mentioned earlier that this deck needs help with speed, and I mean that in two ways. First, I didn't want this deck to dilly-dally with cards that cost more mana than we need to spend for those effects. But second, I also mean that this deck needs help closing the game down. Venturing through dungeons over and over and over again does not win a game on its own. On the other hand, reanimating a ton of creatures will help win the game, but they have to be good creatures. Anyway, all that prelude is just so that I can say that my final swaps will be to buff up our suite of reanimator targets. It's never going to be a bad thing to reanimate one of our dungeon crawling creatures, but from what I've seen of the deck, any creature that doesn't do dungeon stuff really has to be worth its salt. For instance, Shriek Maw, its removal that also triggers Sephiroth with the Evoke effect. Angel of Ruins can discard itself to trigger Sephiroth, and it's a great creature to revive. Phantasmal Image puts in a ton of work by copying anything for just two mana. However, these three cards here slowly stopped performing as much as I thought that they would. Hostage Taker is awesome, but it asks extra mana of us. Cloud Blazer draws cards, which is great, but then that's it. And the Gear Hulk is a tricky thing to reanimate because it often takes out a bunch of our own stuff too, so we don't want to get this one back whenever we're doing well. Any and all of these are good value targets. I love them in Blink decks especially, but when we're finally hitting the reanimation trigger, I think we deserve more than just value. I think we deserve some cards with game-winning power, so I'm going to swap those out for a few more fun friends. First, Waker of Waves is a personal favorite, especially for low-budget reanimation. Like the Angel of the Ruins, it can self-discard to trigger Sephiroth while also digging for more cards, and the body is a respectable beater that hampers enemy token players. And since I do like reviving removal on creatures too, I'll take a page out of the book of my idiot retcast co-host Matt Morgan and throw in the card Demon of Dark Schemes. Goodbye tokens, your death shall become my energy reserve, which can be used to revive even more creatures. Our budget can't afford a massacre worm, but this demon is right on theme for us. I have two more though. Sarah's Emissary is incredible. This card wins games and I can't believe how cheap it is to acquire right now. Play this thing and we gain protection from creatures and so does our whole team? Cool, we can't be attacked and we can't be blocked. That sets us right up for GG. Or we can give protection from instance to avoid pinpoint removal. This card is so flexible and so powerful and very fun to clone. Once you see it in play, you'll get why this is one of the best final bosses that Sephiroth could possibly summon for the end of the dungeon. And what's our final addition? Well, this one surprised me, but dang it, Dream Trawler does work in this deck. It's a big beater that gets huge as we draw more cards, which our Value-tastic deck does a ton of, and it's also able to protect itself. But even more than that, it's a discard outlet. We can trigger Sephiroth every single turn with that effect if we want to, and load the graveyard with even more big baddies at the same time. This card really flew under my radar at first, but once I saw it in action for Sephiroth, I was extremely impressed by it. Try it out, you won't be sorry. That wraps up our official swaps, but real quick, let's go through some honorable mentions, starting with picks for lower budget players. The first thing to note is that a huge chunk of this deck's cost comes from just the mana base. I'm not even kidding, if you cut just four lands from the deck, the price of this deck goes from $140 to $90. 50 bucks just from four lands. And if you want to save another 10 bucks, I'd say to swap out that Shieldred for a card like from the Catacombs. Shieldred is great, but so is this other reanimator card that also helps us take the initiative. By cutting just five total cards, we'd be able to cut $60 out of the price of this deck. Sephiris is a super budget-friendly deck, and that's so awesome to see. How about the other end of the spectrum? What if you're upgrading this deck even more lavishly? Well, there are a lot of places that you could explore, namely with the reanimator targets. Spend some time figuring out which of these boss battles feels the most suitable for you for Sephiroth to revive at the end of the dungeon, because those will likely be the most expensive cards for a Sephiroth deck. You can also upgrade some of the general helpers. This current average deck list couldn't afford to swap in a Path to Exile, for example, or Entomb is a great card for any graveyard deck, plus it triggers Sephiroth too. Ledger Shredder is also bonkers expensive because of 60 card formats, but Sephiris likes it a lot if you happen to have one. And I'll also call out Doom Whisperer to help fill the graveyard and help Sephiris venture every turn too, as well as the card Spark Double, which will help us get through dungeons much faster by copying our commander or else double up on one of our other big awesome reanimator targets, or even our MVP card Radiant Solar. I dare say that a bunch of discards every single turn with that Teferi would be really awesome too. And Persist cards like Glenelendra might be of interest as 
as well to help protect and venture on through. And plenty of folks also build Sephiroth to be a party deck as well to fit in with the Dungeons & Dragons theme. Sephiroth has tons of room for upgrades. It's all about which paths you want to take. All right, that should do it. Here we have the final Sephiroth list. You can find a link to this list in the description below with the cuts in the maybe board. And that puts the done in Dungeon. If you have any other recommendations that you'd like to make for your fellow Sephiroth players, make sure you leave your suggestions down in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.